And so I'm just going to see if we can wait for uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Ferreira to step in before we um, actually start. Okay, I'm shutting my camera off and my, my um, I'm muting myself because I'm going to wash dishes until everybody else comes in. Um, it's just 702. Excuse me, I signed in a little late. Are we waiting for something? We Here. were trying to wait for you and Miss Ferreira to oh. return. <laughs> yep. Um, I think we should start. We can start. I think we should start. Okay. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Community Safety Working Group Public Forum on CREST, the Community Responder for Equity and Social Services Program. My name is Jennifer Moyston. I will be your host today. And for those who do not know me, I am the staff liaison for the Community Safety Working Group. As usual, I have a few bureau bureaucratic issues to go over, but first the co-chairs of the CSWG will read the statement of Indigenous heritage of the land and the acknowledgement of the contribution of African Americans written by community member Lauren Mills. You're muted, Alicia. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, we humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonatuck land Acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. 
Amherst recognizes the generations of African Americans that have contributed to the development of ag agriculture and historical academic preservation from the past to the present. We also recognize the rich spiritual culture, culture, artistic contribution, and pursuits of justice that have enriched the communities in which African Americans have lived, worked, persevered, and achieved. Good evening and thank you all so much for joining us. We are holding this forum to open up dialogue with the community and be transparent about the process in developing the CREST program. We thank you so much for helping inform and guide our work. And without further ado, we'd like to get into a slideshow to talk about the work we have been doing and where we are headed. <clears throat> Can I just bring us back a moment though to go oh. over the rules? I'm so sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Yeah, so as usually the bureaucratic issues of um, a community forum, so our public is aware, we are all here for the common good and the shared success of our community. The CSWG is trying to create an environment where honesty, openness, and trust are the norm. So we are asking everyone in the audience, our panelists and our attendees to A, remember that confidentiality is a must. We would ask that you say it here, share your thoughts and lean into your discomfort, be willing to challenge yourself. Com we're asking for compassionate listening, respect and speak from your own experience and no judgments and no shaming. This is a Zoom meeting, only the panelists and community members speaking will be seen. There's no community chat function, unfortunately. Prevent, please prevent background noise. Keep yourself muted. To mute, click on the microphone on the lower left side of your screen or star six on your phone. To raise your hand if you wish to share your experience or ideas, click on the participants at the bottom of your screen. Choose the raise hand icon or star nine on your telephone. I now would like to introduce the, before I introduce the community safety working group, I just think um, the last, we just came out of our regular community safety working group meeting and it was a little bit deep and we're gonna have some deep discussion today. So as always, as a um, product of my environment, we will take a deep breath um, and close our eyes at the sound of the singing bowl. Just let it all out, inhale, sit up tall and exhale and just feel your body and your muscles relax for a few moments. It's amazing what a deep breath can do. Okay, so now I would like to introduce the community safety working group members so they can go on with their um, forum. So Brianna Owen is our co-chair, Alicia Walker, our co-chair, Tashina Bowman, member Darius Cage, who's uh, not here unfortunately today, Deborah Ferreira, Pat Anabaku, and Russ Vernon Jones. Ms. Moisson, are we free to take over now? <laughs> I'm done hijacking your form, go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, okay, can we, um, I'm sorry, I did the introduction a little bit early uh, before Ms. Moisten was done. So I just want to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us again today that we would like to open this forum up to the community for a dialogue and to be transparent about the process in developing the CREST program. Um, so I would like to share a brief slideshow that we have with you all. Ms. Moisten, would you be able to pull up the PowerPoint? Sure, just one moment. And can you see the PowerPoint now as opposed to a million icons on my screen? Okay, perfect. Um, Brianna, do you can, well, you can just tell me when you need me to scroll, please. Okay, yes. Um, can we 
<clears throat> Do we have membership on the first slide? Sorry, Ms. Moisten, you're muted. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you. So I have, um, the first thing we'd like to report is the membership of the implementation team. We are currently a five member team, including myself as the co-chair of the CSWG, Brianna also co-chair of the CSWG, Russ Vernon Jones, who is a CSWG member and here today, Jennifer Moisten, um, staff liaison to the CSWG, who is also here today, Scott Livingstone, Chief of Police, and Tim Nelson, Chief of Fire. <clears throat> um, I also just wanted to acknowledge briefly that across the country, many municipalities are finding alternative ways to provide safety services in situations that do not require a police officer. Some have existed for a long time and some are new in response to the demands for change that arose after George, George Floyd's murder at the hands of the police. The mission of the CREST program will be to contribute to dismantling systemic racism through racially aware safety and social services <clears throat> to people of all races with a conscious anti-racist focus. Uh, Ms. Moisten, could we go? Oh, perfect. As members of the community may know, the town of Amherst has applied for the Harvard Kennedy Government Performance Lab Alternative 911 Emergency Technical Assistance. Although we did not get to be a part of this, probably partly in, in the fact that we were competing against larger cities and applying, we are able to participate in the alternative 911 emergency response community of practice, which will allow us to participate in conversations with other towns and cities in Massachusetts that are working on developing alternative safety. We have not yet engaged in this dialogue. Alongside the Harvard Kennedy Government Performance Lab Alternative 911 Emergency Technical Assistance Cohort, we also did apply for the Equitable Approaches to Public Safety um, Grant. This grant is from the Executive Office of Health and Human Services at the Department of Public Health. This grant required us to find a mental health agency to partner with and also similarly to the recommendations that the CSWG put forth in our um, recommendations for Part A <laughs> suggested not suggested, um, had us put together a project manager role. This project manager role is similar to what the CSWG envisioned as the assistant director of CRESS. Through the implementation team, we identified a mental health association that we would like to partner with if we receive the grant. And if we do not receive the grant, we still would like to partner with this uh, organization. The organization that we are interested in pairing and partnering with for this grant is the African Diaspora Mental Health Association, ADMHA. African diaspora is the term that is used to refer to the mass dispersion of peoples from, the Afri from Africa during the transatlantic slave trades that occurred from the 1500s to the 1800s. The African diaspora refers to the communities all over the world who are descended from this historic movement of people from Africa to the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe, Middle East, the Middle East, and Asia among other areas across the globe. Currently located in Springfield, Mass, the ADMHA is an outpatient mental health clinic registered and licensed in the state of Massachusetts. The ADMHA was founded in September of 2012 to provide mental health and healthcare services to all people in the greater Springfield and surrounding areas. Their goal is to promote social, emotional, economic, behavioral health, and to establish long-standing resources for children, adult, and families of all people with special emphasis on the African diaspora. Regardless of if we get this grant, the implementation team believes that we should still find a way to invite the ADMHA to the Amherst community. Outside of grants, the implementation team has been working on job descriptions for the CRESS director and project manager. The CRESS director will work with the implementation team once hired. Prior to the hiring of LEAP, implement, the implementation team members work together to format a job description for the CRESS director and project manager. That description is going through the municipal rating system now. We will have more updates on the job description in coming weeks, weeks and hope to work with LEAP in developing all job descriptions for CRESS. LEAP stands for Law Enforcement Action Partnership and their mission is to unite and mobilize the voice of law enforcement in support of drug policy and criminal justice reforms 
that will make communities safer by focusing law enforcement resources on the greatest threats to public safety, promoting alternatives to arrest and incarceration, addressing the root causes of crime, and working towards healing police community relations. They have been hired by the town to help analyze calls to see what safety service calls could be diverted to Cress, to helping with the hiring, resources and training that may be needed for Cress employees, and provide insight to technical questions on areas such as dispatch, handling controlled substances, and transportation. Now that LEAP is officially contracted by the town, included in their scope of work um, is helping us write job descriptions for the Crest project manager and responders. For each, they will provide for us a sample position description, um, hiring criteria, resources, and selection input, and recommended community responder training and supplies. Um, okay, what is next? The next task the implementation team will work on is working with LEAP to determine what skill sets will be needed for CRESS responders and receiving job descriptions from LEAP, launching the CRESS director position and adding them to our team to create the department of CRESS, starting job description, um, starting, starting job search for CRESS responders, developing dispatch protocols and ident identifying CRESS calls with LEAP. Is there another, sorry, is there another what's next slide, Ms. Moiston? Okay, so um, we're working on developing dispatch protocols. That's one of the um, things that is coming next to create an alternative number and to identify which calls can be routed to the Crest Department, identify skill sets and training for dispatch and develop job descriptions to hire dispatch. Is there an additional slide with Ms. Moiston? No, nope, there's not a closing slide. Okay. Um, so with all of that being said, we invite you all to share your recommendations and concerns about how we go about implementing the CRESS program. We may be able to answer some of the questions in regards to the content of the PowerPoint, but many things are yet to be worked out and agreed upon by the implementation team. We will listen, we will be listening carefully and we'll bring all of this feedback to our implementation team meetings. Just as a reminder to the community, Brianna and I report at every CSWG meeting implementation updates and brief meeting summaries. We hope that the community can continue to inform and guide us and be involved in this work. So I would like to invite the community at this time. Um, if anybody has anything that they would like to share with us, please raise your hand um, and I will identify. And if Ms. Moiston, you could bring them in to speak at that time. Like Ms. Lauren has her hand raised. Yes, thank you, Ms. Moisson. Can you please bring Lauren in? Hello, Lauren. Oh. Thank you for being with us today. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, have my, you know, face and voice heard um, because I know that I have been in conversation and wanted to make sure that I supported the ongoing, um, you know, work and the outreach to the community. Um, I don't know if I have one specific uh, question, um, but I guess on my mind is um, like 
what is what when in the past when we were talking about like implementing and starting the Crest program, what what do you think is the the start date? And I guess that's one. Um, like, how do you foresee it? What what's the time frame for it to be implemented? And I know there was some concern about the outreach to communities of color and not um, the Crest program being overwhelmed by like college students or needs of you know the college um, the college population. So, is there anything else? that is going to happen to like, you know, really make sure that there's communication with um, communities of color. And also, um, I, I know that I haven't um, read all of the, um, you know, the goals and the, 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 the paperwork that, you know, um, was initially given to the, the town council and um, all the recommendations that um, the CSWG put forward in detail. Um, but I guess my main concern is when we do talk about, you know, mental health and mental awareness is um, like getting, there's, there's a, there's a, I guess a, a stage where like a gray area where maybe, you know, a person may not be diagnosed with something or they might be going through like a, a rough time in their life. And, you know, how is, how are we going to, how is the Crest program going to like help like situations that are like life situations that are like maybe housing situations or, you know, something that's bringing on stress that's, you know, can be a temporary situation um, and separate that from like a mental health, an ongoing mental health situation. So I guess, yeah, those are the things that are kind of on my mind. Thank you for sharing with us, Lauren. Um, I think we have another hand in the audience, Ms. Moisten, if you could please bring in um, Demetria Shabazz. Yes, I'm just switching, I'm moving Lauren back to the attendee role. Thank Just you. One moment. Hello. Um, Thank you, CSWG, for holding this forum on um, up and updating the community on. Um, I did listen in a little bit on the CSWG meeting, and someone mentioned that um, this is something that benefits the whole community. So again, I really appreciate you seeking input. Um, and also updating us on where things are. So two things. Um, one, I guess I'm asking for a clarification on what was eventually funded by the town council and agreed upon by the town council. Um, from what I understand, and, and again, it, it may have just been, you know, missed because of the, the many weeks of that have gone by but am i to understand that there are eight uh responders that have been funded and um if you could also clarify what does that mean if eight uh uh responders have been funded will these grants that you all are applying for um provide the supports 
for these eight responders, meaning transportation, um, a place, uh, you know, uh, as far as like a, a phone, phone lines or the many other support systems that are needed uh, for these eight responders to uh, potentially uh, respond to different mental health crises in the community. Um, so that's, those are kind of my questions and comments. And again, thank you for holding this forum. Thank you for sharing with us, Demetria. Uh, and the other, Dr. Shabazz has a, a question and a comment. Do you want to take it now or you want to wait? Uh, I think it's okay for um, him to go ahead and share it with us. All right. Thank you very much. And I add um, to where <clears throat> we started, and that is um, <clears throat> the timeline is, is the timeline, but um, is I seem to recall uh, the public there being kind of community education se sessions established. I appreciate the public comment here, but is there a projection maybe after the position is staffed up to introduce that person to the community and let that person also kind of, you know, update and give a vision to the community? Is that somewhere on the horizon? Thank you, Mr. Shabazz. Uh, Ms. Moisten, if you could please bring in Lev Ben Ezra. You should be filtering through now. Thank you. Hi, love. Thank you for being here with us today. Hi. Hey, um, thank you so much for hosting this event um, and to all of you and the entire CSWG team. Um, really appreciate the work that's demonstrated and uh, just have a few questions or considerations to add. Um, I uh, am particularly interested, uh, based on my role at the MR Survival Center and thinking about our potential organizational utilization of this resource. Um, so I am curious if there has been any further consideration of CRESS being reached via 911 or an alternate number. Um, I understand there were some very uh, critical reasons to have an alternate number that wasn't at all connected to the record keeping or uh, streamline of 911. Um, and I can also really see in the value, the value of the simplicity of accessing it through, through a known channel um, and being able to divert calls that the caller might not know whether or not this is something that could get handled by CRAS or requires APD and being able to have dispatch route that. So that's one question that I'm curious about. I would also like to um, just kind of, I guess, express a recommendation or my own enthusiasm as part of the Amherst Social Service uh, Organizational Network that um, I would really hope to see strong coordination with existing social services um, so that there can be really good linkages and referrals rather than attempting to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I also think that there is potential for a really helpful feedback loop or feedback mechanism back to those organizations around specific gaps that are causing challenges that then there are crisis or emergency responses that are happening after hours. Obviously, any given organization may or may not be able to address that in the short term or potentially even in the long term, but I think it would be really helpful to think about how that information or what's going out there can, can cycle back to us in terms of thinking about those roles of addressing basic needs that are um, and various social support 
practices that are at the root of uh, many of these types of challenges. And, um, and then the last question that I had at this time is um, kind of about the types of calls that will get diverted. And so I've certainly heard a lot of talk around directing mental health related crises to this alternative support, but um, I would love to hear any further information and um, further decisions in terms of other types of calls, like would things like traffic calls or loitering or other things like that be going to CRESS? I don't have a list of recommendations in my mind, but I'm just kind of curious about some of those other pieces. And similarly, um, is there a mechanism built in or uh, will the implementation be thinking about CRESS's capacity to handle both uh, crisis or emergency calls and also non-emergency um, calls uh, that could go in. So those were some of the pieces that um, kind of from a pragmatic side that I've been thinking um, about in terms of utilization of, of CRESS once it gets developed. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us and sharing love. And um, Laura Decker will be entering the room now. Great, thank you. Hello, Laura, thank you for being here. Hi, thanks. Um, Laura Drocker, uh, District 2. Um, just wanna thank you all for all your hard work. Um, I've been following your work from afar and just um, really thankful for the work you're doing. I know it's difficult um, and particularly just applying for all those grants is really time consuming. So um, kudos for, for that work. Um, just, you know, wanted to just say, I'm really excited to see where this goes. Um, I was actually, ex <clears throat> saw, an, saw something this week that made me feel like it might've been somebody that was in a mental health crisis or a drug related crisis that could benefit from services. And it just made me think about how beneficial this service will be um for our community when it's when it's available so i just echo the sort of thoughts about you know outreach and training for our community to make sure we utilize this service um to its full um, extent and in the way it meant is meant to to be used i don't have any strong ideas of how to do that yet but um i know you all will have some good ones so thanks Thank you for sharing that with us, Laura. Uh, Ms. Moyston, if you could please bring in Judith Glaser. Hi, Judith. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Well, I've been watching you from afar, from the beginning, and I just can't thank you enough for what has been an incredible amount of work. Um, much more work than a committee usually does, and you've done it so well. I wanted to mention um, a concern kind of that I've had all along. I was back uh, quite a while ago when you were talking about the CRESS responders being uh, town employees. I was really glad because I was in human services for a long time and I see how those services get squeezed and squeezed by their own contracts to the point that they're paying terrible salaries and not giving good benefits. And um, I'm looking forward to learning more about the African Diaspora Mental Health Association. But um, because they're an outpatient mental health service, they may be subject to the same kind of squeezing. And I just um, want to be sure that our responders are paid 
uh, salaries that are in concert with other emergency responders we have in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Ms. Moyston, if you could please bring Joanna in. Hi, Joanna, thank you for being here today. Hi, sorry, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am not a resident of Amherst. I work there. I'm a resident of Montague, but I have been following what you've been doing as well and coming to some meetings. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for providing a local model for other towns to look towards. I know it's a lot of work, but it really is something to be proud of. And that's really all I have for you. But thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us, Joanna. I was wondering, co-chairs, if you wanted to address some of the more basic questions and perhaps that could get some dialogue started. Yeah, so just off the bat, um, thank you everyone who made time to join us this forum and to provide questions. Um, I took some notes and for the questions that I don't have an answer to, I will work on getting answers. And I encourage you all to join us for the remainder of our CSWG meetings so you can continue to hear updates on where we're at with um, the implementation meetings. Um, so one question I wanted to answer was the alternative number from 911. So as far as I know, the implementation team does want there to be a separate number from 911 to access CRESS, um, but we will still be able to, um, for people to reach CRESS from the 911 dispatch. Um, in regards to the types of calls that will be diverted, um, that is something that LEAP is still working on and they haven't delivered that data to us yet. I think Ms. Mills had asked, um, what was the time frame? So are, we have an approximate time frame. if you'd want to speak about that. So the I know the CREST program is due to launch in February. Um, and so that is the deadline we are working with right now. Um, we are still waiting sort of to iron out when each step will take place. And that will be informed by the data that we get from LEAP. Um, and so I think there was a similar or a question along the same lines in regards to the eight, the funding for the eight responders. Um, and that was something that was allowed the town council that we were um, giving 
given funding for a minimum of eight responders, but we are also still waiting for the LEAP data to tell us how many responders should be on per each shift. Um, and I think what's, what um, the shift should look like and the scheduling. And so those things will also inform if we will pursue funding for additional responders or how we will staff, um, how we will staff the program will really be based off of the LEAP data, but we will have a minimum of eight responders. Um, another concern that I wanted to address was um, the referrals and not recreating the wheels. The CREST program will definitely work with the existing social service agencies in the area. And uh, when we did meet with the ADMHA, we did ask about their experience with um, referrals and providing resources for people who they interact with. And they said they are experienced with that. And we hope that's something that um, the CREST program will provide for people. Um, do you, do you want to speak on how we kind of talked about the follow up work that happens so that, you know, Crest isn't going out to a resident and then that's, you know, they solve that problem and that's it, that there's there's some follow up behind that. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, I think we've been looking more into so it's all still under development, but we've been looking into the follow up process and having some sort of case management so that they're there is somebody reaching out to people who are utilizing um, the CREST program and who are and who are we, who we are responding to. We're hoping that ADMHA will also have the ability to have um, provide case management to families and work on other things that might be needed. And we were also trying to find some sort of way to have a referral list or a central list of a hub of resources available that could satisfy a variety of different needs that people have when they call for um, emergency safety services. Deborah? Yeah, so I just wanted to thank again, um, Alicia, Brianna and Russ for being on the implementation team. Um, obviously we know it's a, a lot of work along with all the other partners who are on there uh, from the town. But I guess as a follow-up, when you had said that the, the um, CREST launches is, is around the timetable, might be around February. Um, so does that mean um, the director will be on board in February and then we'll help to kind of hire? Or what, what, what have you all, have you talked a little bit about that? Just wanted to get an idea. Yeah, so we have at this point drafted a job description for the director um, and that job description we have handed off to HR who is running it through the municipal rating process. Um, so we, we don't have a great idea of how long that process necessarily takes, but one of the things under our contract with LEAP is that they will continue to help us move forward in terms of crafting job descriptions. And so the idea is that we will hire the director as soon as possible. So as soon as we have a working job description that has gone through all of the processes, we will have that posted. And we're hoping that to have them on board before February so that they can continue to serve on the implementation team with us. There were quite a few questions in regards to the training and skill sets. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? We don't have, you know, a lot, but we could speak on a little bit of it. Yeah. So in regards to the training, we're hoping that once we hire the Crest director, they'll be able to help us with that. But in additionally, the LEAP contract, um, they will be working with us to design each position and suggest training and supplies for each role. So we're hoping that they're able to guide our work. And once we have a better idea of the calls that will be that the Crest program will cover, we'll understand more of the skill set needed, and that will probably inform the training and the supplies needed. Deborah. So just to, um, to kind of keep the dialogue going, what are some of the ways that the implementation team thinks will be a way to kind of keep the community engaged and 
um, you know, continuing, continuing to give feedback. I know Brianna had said that um, obviously to tune in because that's one of the, 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 the great ways, right? Is to tune into CSWG meetings because we're always uh, talking about it and making sure that we're, you know, 150% supportive of getting Crest off the ground in a way that is sustainable and it's gonna be impactful and it's gonna help out um, all communities, but especially BIPOC communities and those that have been impacted in so many ways for so, for so long. Um, but what are some of the other ways that you think feedback might be able to be given? So I think we've discussed as an implementation team that we would want to have ongoing outreach and um, ongoing opportunities for the community to provide feedback and for us to update the community in regards to what we are doing. Um, and so we have discussed the possibilities of having other forums or having other events where we go directly out into the community to get feedback. Uh, those things are all in the works and the the emergence of the Delta variant is sort of making those things something we still need to discuss and work out exactly what that would look like and if that's still a possibility at this time, but we do plan to continue to present the community with platforms in which they can engage and be informed about the work happening. Um, Miss Pat, and then if you can bring Lauren back in, Miss Marston. So first of all, I want to thank everybody that came out tonight um, and for those who spoke. I am wondering if the two coaches, you know, could share, if any, are there any challenges that the implementation team is facing? Or is there a way that the community could support the team? I think one of the obstacles that we're facing right now is restructuring our original time frame. Um, given that we weren't able to get the contract signed by LEAP in the time frame that we had intended to, everything is a little bit set back and we're really waiting um, for the data from LEAP to guide our work in the responder position, the project manager position, and the skill set that we're going to need for the program. And I would say that contract being delayed has been an obstacle to move our group forward. Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, so Miss Lauren's here and she's been, she's had her hand up for a few moments and she's in as a panelist now. If we could have her ask her question, Miss Lauren. Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. I just have, I think one other question um, cause I, my connection went in and out. Um, so I don't know if you um, had talked about this but when you say responders, um, can you clarify, is that just like responding to a call or is that like also responding, you know, going out to, you know, wherever a person is, uh, will we have a description of that or do we have a description of that now? Like, what would that actually look like, a responder? Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Is that something I can answer now, Ms. Moyston? Um, okay, so the Community Responders is the name of the individuals who will be responding to calls. So not, not dispatch people answering the phone, but the people who will be um, hands-on working within the community. Um, and so we are hoping to build at least two responders per team so that they will be responding to calls in a set. And we are waiting for the call data from LEAP in order to identify which skill sets would be best to put together in order to, to respond to the types of calls that are going to be diverted to the Quest team. And maybe we should just, can you speak on how, for the most part, these are nonviolent calls. So the, they're calls that have come back and been reported as nonviolent that Crest will be. responding to.
Yeah, sorry. I don't know if you want to, me to elaborate that on elaborate on that a little bit more um, because we don't have exact categories for which calls they'll be responding to yet. Um, but we that that is what Leap is doing right now. So they're analyzing the calls to figure out which calls are nonviolent and how they're coded in the system and how those things can be switched to the Crest team and which skill sets would be needed to best respond to those calls. Um, and so once we get that data, we can sort of craft, uh, for example, if we want a responder team to have de-escalation skills or mental health training or what, what type of background we would want them to have will be based off of the data that we receive from LEAP. So I, I hope that was helpful. If, if anybody else wants to elaborate, um, Brianna, I'm not sure if that's what you were planning to do. No, I think you said it perfectly. Um, okay. Ms. Pat had her hand up. So I was going to ask the co-chairs if uh, they could explain to the audience in terms of um, how the CREST program will look like in collaborating with the um, APD and also the fire department, the fire department, the um, the medic, the dispatcher, yeah, the coordination. So in regards to the, the coordination between medics and the police department, that's something that we're still working on right now. We hope that LEAP will be able to provide us um, the data from the calls as to whether as to whether or how many medics they think we'll need on our team or available to develop that further. Mr. Vernon Jones. I wanted to again express my appreciation to everyone who came out tonight and uh, in particular to those who spoke. Uh, as you asked some many of those questions, I went, oh yes, we're gonna have to answer that question, aren't we? But we don't have an answer yet. And to others, I, you know, there was a proposal hidden in them and I went, oh, that's a good idea. Yes, we'll probably wanna do that. Um, so we've taken notes uh, in response to your questions and uh, this forum I think has been more helpful to us already than you know. Um, Ms. Pat asked about challenges. We haven't talked much about this, but I think the big challenge down the road is really gonna be finding the best possible employees, the best possible community responders. Uh, and any of you in the community, if you know people uh, who might um, be good candidates uh, for being part of the CREST program. Uh, we're not hiring yet, uh, but we welcome suggestions of names or ideas uh, from anybody at any time. Um, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, and on that note, you know, just to kind of uh, add to what uh, Mr. Vernon Jones said, um, you know, definitely, you know, reaching out to the community to get back to us and, and send out, you know, whatever names, information they have in terms of people that might um, be able to apply for these positions, because we're looking for obviously a diverse um, group of people with, you know, diverse backgrounds, language, uh, abilities, everything, right? Because we want folks to be able to connect uh, to community members um, and to be able to connect to all community members in Amherst. Um, we do not want just, you know, folks that are only going to connect to a certain segment of Amherst. That's, that's done, you know? We want to make sure that these folks are going to be inclusive, are going to be about equitable, about anti-racism, um, you know, and, and really be able to, to connect with people across all platforms. Um, so it's going to be imperative for, for this to be a true partnership in terms of making sure that, you know, one, like we heard from, you know, some of the, the questions that, that came out that, you know, 
whomever ends up being the director, whoever ends up being part of Crest eventually to hiring is outreaching to the community and being in partnership with the community, but also the community being in partnership with Crest, right? I think that that's the way it's going to, to work out the best. So it's gonna be constant communication. So yeah, we definitely need everyone's help with this. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Do we end the, do we need to end this? I would like to just ask our attendees if there is anybody else who would like the opportunity to speak or to share, but has not had a chance um, that if you would raise your hand Ms. Moisten, if you can please bring Meg Gage in. Hi, Meg, thank you for being here with us today. Chance to participate. And uh, I just wanna thank you for the hard work and uh, how complicated it's been and um, what a good job you've done of listening. I'm really sorry to see that Jen is in her office at five minutes to eight. <laughs> she, and I I'm just thank you, want to thank you for what you're doing. And I guess I do want to give a shout out to Jennifer, who's uh, been a uh, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and in the middle of the scenes, uh, important person in our town for the last couple of years. Oh, thank you so much, Miss Mag. But to all of you, really, thank you for your leadership. And this has not been easy. And I hope you'll call on us if we have skills that you could use. Brava. Thank you. Bye. I, got, I want to stop being a panelist. <laughs> That's a really strange picture of me, but oh well. <laughs> thank you, Meg. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, did you have your hand raised or? Yes, this may be a little out of order in a forum on CRESS, but I just wanted to remind the public that the Community Safety Working Group uh, has continued to work since we made the CRESS proposal. Uh, and we have other proposals that were in our first report that we hope the community will continue to attend to and provide support for and speak out for. And we really encourage you, we have another report coming out probably late October uh, and we really invite you and encourage you to, to read that report and support those proposals as well. Uh, it has been so helpful to us to have the, the, the strong positive community response to CRESS. Uh, and we look forward to uh, engaging with you around those other proposals and hoping you will engage with the, the other leadership bodies in town to see that many of them can be implemented um, in a, in a very thorough and important way. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Uh, Ms. Moisten, can you please bring Lauren in? Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, I have just one more question. <laughs> one more question. Um, that's on my mind. Um, I uh, just uh, picturing what this might look like compared to like other um, social service or community services when people are in need. I know transportation is a big part of you know what can like black folks want or if they're in crisis, getting them to a you know certain place, um, is that something that it has there, you know thought through? And also, like, is this like program going to be something that is more like? I know people need to be aware of it, but is it going to be like are the vehicle? If there are vehicles, 
are they going to have crests on the outside of the vehicle so people are like so it's known it's something that people are aware of or is it something more like if they're dealing with something very personal that they wouldn't necessarily want uh, people to know that they're getting help with it's just I, I know this is maybe something small but it's just a question that I have um Ms. Lauren, no question, it's too small when it comes to implementing a program. Thank you very much. Thank you Do for you, sharing, Lauren. Yeah, I was gonna say, although we have discussed the importance of having vehicles and that is something we do plan to work out um, in the future, we don't have that set in stone. And I think it's very helpful that you brought up the um, labeling of the vehicle as something that we can take into consideration when we do get to that conversation. And do you wanna speak on her first part of the question in regards to helping people get to appointments? We had spoken about that at a couple of the implementation meetings and um, ADMHA said they could possibly, well, I'll, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, so we have, I, well, we have discussed these things. I just don't think we have like a, a set in stone answer. And so there is the possibility that ADMHA will be able to transport people to appointments and such. Um, and we're hoping that we may be able to have access to multiple forms of transportation as well. But again, those are things that we will have to iron out. And I think that they will also be dependent on um, what happens with the grant process that we're still waiting to see um, if we were approved for the grant. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna explain a little bit about the grant, how it, you know, it's a larger amount that has to be split between the organization, just a little bit in, in more detail? Yeah, so the grant is um, a collaborative grant. And so it requires us to collaborate with a uh, mental, health, uh, mental health or social service. And so that we chose the ADM ADMHA and the grant amount will be split between the two um, organizations if we do receive it. Um, and so I think though that there is general consensus that we will try to figure out how to partner with them regardless of, of whether or not we receive the grant. Um, but just under this grant, if we do receive it, that is one of the requirements and one of the things we are working on. Ms. Pat and then Ms. Ferreira. Oh, I just want to publicly uh, uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Ms. Mary Beth, who was part of the implementation team before she resigned. I, I, she worked very hard on that team and she was instrumental in reaching out to the mental health organization in Springfield. I was the one who recommended that uh, organization when I attended one of the meetings. So I just want to let the public know uh, the role of uh, Mary Beth. She immediately, I got into action when I suggested the group and it happened. So I just want to like thank her for quick action. Thank you, Ms. Pat, uh, Ms. Ferreira and then Ms. Owen. I just wanted to make a quick point around transportation because I know that when we were, uh, you know, making our recommendations and looking into Crest, that was one of the points that came up over and over again in terms of the research is making sure that there is um, transportation available um, for people that we are assisting through Crest uh, to get to appointments. And if they refer it to any social service agencies, whatever they're going th through, that they also have that transportation, um, you know, moving forward, right, to help someone out and especially someone that's in crisis or going through a situation. So I think that that would be an important part um, to, to, so thank you, you know, Lauren and others who have made that point, but that would be an important part to make sure that's continued to be highlighted because that comes up over and over again in a lot of different environments. Transportation is key. So that needs to be really thought out and, and put some funding towards to make sure that it happens. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Um, Ms. Owen. Um, I had a similar comment to Ms. Ferreira, but I just want to thank Lauren for bringing up um, the concern around transportation and for helping people with non-urgent um, maybe appointments or referrals and not 
and having maybe considering unmarked vehicles. I think that's really important and I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Ms. Pat? So one thought that um, when we worked on our charge, uh, part A and part B, in looking back, it would have been, it would have made a lot of sense to include traffic control into Crest program. Because part of the issues that happens with BIPOC interaction with APD is traffic stops. So in hindsight, it would have been better to um, have recommended, you know, including traffic uh, stops with Crest program. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, and I think, you know, when we were discussing it, um, traffic stops was something that I know we, a bunch of us brought up, um, but I think that we can still address it and, and make sure that it is part of our recommendations um, around part B, even though you're right, Ms. Pat, you know, obviously there needs to be some funding and, and, you know, behind it, which is why, you know, possibly it would have made better sense to have it there because since already funding has been allotted for this next fiscal year, but, you know, something that we could still put in, even if it's included in the next fiscal year, um, because that's going to be crucial. That's going to be key to make sure that, that that gets addressed because obviously, as we know, that's one of the main ways that um, people of color specifically, you know, BIPOC populations get profiled uh, by the police and harassed and uh, mistreated. Um, so we need to have that. Uh, it's critical. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. You just, Perhaps that's a good well, place to wrap it up. Yeah, I was going to ask if you wanted to give a quick um, rundown of the of what Chris is working on now. After we, after Deborah speaks, she has her hand raised. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just can't say it enough because I think Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Pat, I think everyone has said it, Leisha and Brianna and Tashina, we need to have um, the community involvement and you all have been it's spectacular, you know, in terms of all the support, all the involvement that you have um, given us throughout this whole process. I think that that's what gives us the, the power to continue to move forward, but we're still not done as Mr. Vernon Jones and others have stated, we're still doing the work. So please continue to uh, be involved, continue to send the feedback, continue to guide us, continue to share, um, you know, just, you know, all your ideas, fabulous, you know, and we're guided by what you all want us to do. So it has to be us together doing this together. So, um, you know, we, we're, we're here until, as a group, until November 1st. So please utilize us, send us support, and make sure that that you know we we hear you. You know we're hearing you every step of the way, and 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 we continue and we want to continue to do you know everything um, that you want us to do. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Ms. Bowman. So I also I wanted to add to that and say that remember this is. This is our community too. And so I would like to see um, the BIPOC community continue to make their voices heard, um, continue to voice their concerns and their criticism of the Amherst um, community, like just as far as like where they are failing us as a community like failing the BIPOC community and like you know just because um our service is ending you you know I want to encourage you to keep talking and keep um showing up to meetings as often as you can um showing up to forums when you can um bringing people along when you can um 
reaching out and trying to talk to um, the people who are blindly leading this community. Um, because I just, I really think that, you know, we can't continue to let this die over and over and over again because we're here and we're not being seen. So just, you know, I just wanna encourage that um, of the community. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Ms. Owen. Um, just as a last remark before we wrap up, I want to again am amplify what um, Ms. Pat had said and thank Mary Beth for really getting our group off the ground, helping us apply for grants and really facilitating the meetings and getting this going. I also want to thank the community for coming out today. And if you're in the audience and maybe didn't get a chance to share with us, I do really encourage you to email us because we'd love to hear your perspective um, and continue to hear that. And we'd like you to guide and inform our work. We really want this to be community-based and we are very grateful for you coming and making the time to be with us tonight. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Uh, Ms. Moyston. I just wanted to kind of touch up on what uh, Ms. Ferrer was saying. And so as far as the community being involved and thinking that some of the community responders, it would be great if they could be, we already have individuals in the community who are already looked upon as natural leaders and it would be nice to see if we could it's possible to get some of those individuals into some of these positions so that transition over isn't so hard there's already a trusted face there um for the community to to see so i wanted just to add that and then i don't know if you guys want to talk about the other recommendations that you made in part a or if you just want to end and we can continue our meeting I would suggest we let everybody turn to other turn to other concerns. Sounds good. Um, Miss Alicia and Miss Owen, do you have a statement exiting us? We can do the singing bowl again because you know, a long deep breath is always helpful. Oh, I think that would be great, Miss Weston. Alicia, are you in agreement? So again, uh, we thank everyone for coming out tonight. We appreciate it. This, the Community Safety Working Group obviously wouldn't be able to work so hard without all of the help from the community. And um, so we are gonna say good night. And on the sound of the singing bowl, I'm gonna ask you to take a deep breath and kind of um, sit up nice and tall and straight. And then as you exhale, feel your body relax. I never exactly know when to tell everybody to come back because everyone looks like they're enjoying it so much. Um, so um, CSWG members, would you like to say goodbye to our audience and we can continue on with our meeting? Or they can stay. Oh yes, they're more than welcome to stay, yes. guys left off with two more items on the agenda. Okay, so I think the last two items of the agenda that we did not get to before the forum were just an update in regards to the resident oversight board and the successor group. Um, so I just wanted to report back to the group that Brianna and I have asked Mr. Balkaman to review our successor group document again. 
He told us that he would review it over the weekend and we have emailed him to request a meeting on how to move forward, but have not heard back um, anything directly yet. <clears throat> Brianna, myself and Mr. Vernon Jones were able to meet with Chief Livingstone last week um, in order to review the draft of the resident oversight um, board document that we have. He did identify possible areas of conflict in the draft. Um, and what he identified to us was the subpoena power possibility being, um, being a possible conflict, conflict with the union. Um, so we are now taking a minute to look at the Springfield Oversight Board because they do have subpoena powers. Um, and we want to see how they may have overcome any obstacles that, or if they have even come across any with the union and with their, their ability to subpoena. Um, he also identified another potential area of, of conflict being the involvement in the contract negotiation. So he is wondering how or what we would want that to look like. Um, if we would want a representative from the resident oversight board at the negotiations directly, or if we would just want them to be continued to be informed as to how the negotiations are going. Um, according to the chief, it usually takes about six months to negotiate a contract and not much has changed within these contracts in the last 30 years. Um, he stated that promotions are con contractual. Um, sergeants are promoted by a written test and interviews and lieutenants are and captains are promoted through solely interviews. Um, the chief did remind us, though, that the civilians are welcome to participate in the interview process. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones and Brianna, feel free to fill in if I missed any gaps there um, in the overview. No, I, th I think that was an excellent summary. Um, yeah. the chief was you know quite open to having um, input uh, with regard to hiring um, and I think his I mean you, you should correct me if if I'm if you think if the team feels differently but um, our interest in or at least my thought was that the resident oversight board should be consulted before negotiations begin are there changes that the resident oversight board would like to see in the contract? Uh, and then after the team sides present their uh, positions, it'd be great to have the resident oversight board consulted. If the, the union is requesting some change in the contract, it might be fine, or it might be some reason the resident oversight board would have a major objection to it. Uh, so I don't think it was that we want a resident oversight board member to sit in the negotiations. That's a terribly time consuming and thing that much of which would not be relevant, but to be consulted about the policy and, and working condition issues uh, seemed like an important part of the resident oversight board being able to impact, um, you know, how things go in the police department. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Pat. So just a comment. Um, I've been hearing that the resident oversight board may not have as much power as we would like it to be. One of the suggestions that is coming, and I emailed um, a link to everyone that Dr. Chavez, you know, has sent to me. And that's, you know, we may not have enough time tonight, but for us to think about exploring ordinance in terms of establishing resident oversight board it might be it might have more power than what we are trying to do right now so i don't know if it's too late to include that in our november election or whatever the process but we need to have a resident overboard um, oversight board that you know will actually make changes and, and, do, and do the right thing and not being constrained by what the town administration, you know, uh, want or doesn't want. So we may not have enough time tonight, but I think we should 
seriously um, explore that. I'm happy to call the uh, town clerk and see how the process goes or something like that, if people want me to. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon Jones. I think it would be great to have an ordinance written that uh, codifies the resident oversight board. Writing that kind of detailed legal language is not a quick process. Uh, and I don't think we need it in order to implement the resident oversight board. I think we need it to establish it and make sure that its powers are not eroded over time. And I would think that that would be one of our recommendations, implement it right away and immediately begin to get lawyers to write a, an ordinance that would codify everything that's in our proposal. I, I think you're absolutely right, Ms. Pat, that, that it should become an ordinance. So, um, yes, Ms. Pat. So I hear what you're saying, Mr. Ross, but what is the problem for us to actually get more information and maybe educate the community, some people who may not, you know, know the, um, the significance or impact of ordinance. Um, you know, we can still implement what we are recommending, the resident oversight board, but I think we should at least explore it and include it in our recommendation. I see if we can even try, you know, put it in, in a, our local election soon. I mean, when is the next election? Two years from now? Well, so an ordinance time. can be passed by the town council. Council, okay. okay. Ms. Moiston. I was just going to add that the Human Rights Commission has a bylaw as well. So they have the, it was something that was voted through town meeting and that's how the Human Rights Commission became. Thank you, Ms. Moiston. I mean, I don't, I, if it's all right with the rest of the group, I think it's okay to pursue more information on that while we wait and that it's just knowing that it's not a process that we can take on or that we can see through as a group, but I think pursuing more information on how the process works can't, it can only be helpful. <clears throat> Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, as long as we still have some community members here, uh, if anyone knows an attorney who would like to volunteer to put some legal language, we, we have a fairly detailed proposal written. Uh, and if anybody knows an attorney who might want to offer some pro bono work to turn it into a, a bylaw or ordinance, uh, please let us know. I, we, we could begin that immediately if we had somebody interested and available to work pro bono. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. So, yeah, um, yes, Ms. Ferreira. So, um, are we, I, don't, I didn't want to switch, but kind of what we're talking about, because we kind of, kind of just went over the whole thing with the uh, succession group. Um, in terms of that, you all had talked to Mr. Bachman and, and you know, haven't really heard. So I guess what's going to be the process with that since our time is coming to an end fairly quickly. Um, and also, I guess for me, it brought up the whole thing. Why isn't Mr. Bachman at our meetings anymore? Is it just because he can't make it or, is, or what's going on? Because, you know, he's really never attended any other meetings of ours for like a long time. Um, so you think you might have some information on that? So when we switched him to Thursdays, he's usually at the TSO meetings. So we used to meet on Wednesdays and then we switched our meetings to Thursdays and he was already obligated to TSO meetings. I'm, that might be able to change. I don't, or if we just specifically say, can you come attend to the next meeting? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I guess that was never made clear to me that obviously he wouldn't be able to attend any other meetings because he had a standing meeting on Thursdays. 
I don't know that. Because maybe we could have made some accommodations. I think it's important for him to, at least I would think that would be important for him to attend our meetings like he used to attend before. Um, and then and then also, you know, to just be able to give us some answers quickly because again, our time is is coming to an end and, and we have a lot of questions remaining. Um, and, and having our co-chairs who are already working overtime to do everything else to kind of go back and forth with him on, on different things, you know, it, it's just not doable all the time. Can he attend one of the meetings that we're gonna be having? Do we need to switch things around so he can be at a meeting? I'm like, you know, we, we need to get some answers. Um, Miss Owen, and then I think Mr. Vernon Jones also had a hand up. Deborah, I think you're right. And I think time is ticking and we need to get the successor group going and the resident oversight board going. Would the group be in favor of Alicia and I reaching out to Mr. Bockelman to attend our next meeting on the 23rd? And I know that, that the bulk of that meeting will be dedicated to going over the draft of the final report, but I think maybe we can dedicate the first 15, 20 minutes to have a dialogue with him about how we're gonna move this forward as a group. So all voices are heard and we're all on the same page about what the next steps are. Is everybody okay with that? Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, I think we have tended frankly to get more work done when the town manager was not with us. Um, because when he has an answer to something that we don't like, uh, we end up spending quite a bit of time trying to convince him. Uh, and that has, in my opinion, not been a productive use of our meeting time. Um, but I think this, the question that, that Deborah raised really applies to all of our recommendations. Once we go out of existence on November 1st, and you know we've put these very carefully thought out, some cases very detailed, thorough, important recommendations out, what's the process for making sure that they get seriously considered and adopted? Uh, you know, I hope that the uh, town council would take initiative on that and look at each of them one at a time. Um, but I think there, there's a lot to talk about there about how we, um, you know, if, if we're not around as a group to uh, sort of monitor the implementation of them and the new committee is not yet formed, uh, there's a real gap there. Uh, and I think it's important that that be addressed with the town manager and perhaps with the town council as well. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, um, Ms. Ferreira, Ms. Pat, and then Ms. Owen. Well, I mean, I, I, I disagree with that just because, you know, one with the town manager, I just feel like he, he would attend meetings when it was things that what was important to him. And he, and we weren't, and we didn't spend time just going back and forth because he was very supportive of the crest and, and doing certain things. So then that, that happened. The only times that we have had to kind of go back and forth has been with certain things like ending of CSWG and so on and so forth. And those things are gonna happen. I mean, that's that's a part of it. So for me, one is just like, obviously, you know, showing that this thing has not been a priority to him or to the town and that we're, we've basically been on our own to try to figure out things. And, and the other thing is not fair to our chair always having to go to him and others to, to try to figure things out when that was before we could just ask them a question during the meeting and most often it was just yes this or let's get more clarification and let's find out about this or about that you know so I think that it would be important to have them at a meeting because uh, if not it's always you know uh, our chairs having to go and, and 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 take their time to try to figure all the stuff out you know and then the other thing is that it is important to um, make sure that, well, I actually lost my train of thought. So I'll come back. Okay. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, Miss Pat. That's okay, Deborah. It's been a long night already. <laughs> okay. So let me just break it down. I don't know about you guys. I can't speak for anyone. Are we really surprised? that the town manager has not started putting together successor group. My worst fear is coming, is becoming a reality. And that is 
we will be done with our charge November 1st. And there will be no um, resident oversight board in place. It will eventually be, but we won't have that. We will not have the successor committee, the Committee Safety and Social Justice Committee. Until we go away, and God knows how, you know, those two committees will be set up. I am not surprised. I don't know about you guys. I'll just leave it that way. Why are we surprised? And that's the point. That's why we created, you know, we had a subcommittee that worked on successor committee. So give to the town manager, you know, for review, make any changes he wants to do, or give us feedback or anything. How long ago did we give him this? And there's no, I've not heard that a, the successor committee is being put together yet. And we, you know, we're running out of time. Let's put it that way. Thank you, Ms. Okay. I think Ms. Owen and then Ms. Ferreira. I wanna propose that we invite him to the last half hour of our meeting so that we can have a discussion on the successor group and the resident oversight board group. I think that the, the CSWG has really engaged the community and I don't want to discourage members who may be interested in either of those groups. And I want there to be transparency to the people who are following us and the people who want to see a successor group and resident oversight board. And I think that has to happen with Mr. Bockelman at a meeting. Thank you, Ms. Owen, Ms. Ferreira, and then Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, and thank you, Ms. Pat. It, it has been a long night and I am tired, <laughs> but I didn't remember it uh, right after um, you started speaking. I was like, oh, this is my point. So my point is that, you know, it, it's different in terms of like, I know that all the recommendations we're going to make are going to be important for us to put in place. However, the successor group and kind of putting pressure that that happens is going to be critical because that's the, we need to see first and foremost, how is that going to be done? Who are going to be uh, the members of that group? Because for me, I really think that, you know, they're trying to either not have a successor group, one, or two, have a successor group that's going to be very weak and not do much. And so if we have a weak success, successor group or no successor group, I don't know what's going to happen with the oversight board, right? So you have to have a strong successor group in order to then have an oversight board and in order for any of those recommendations to be put in place. So I really do think that that's different. And that's why I think we need to keep the pressure on and we need to talk to Mr. Bachman, you know, and, and, and let him know that this is important and let him know that what the timeline is so that this can, can happen. Because again, I see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the definition of white supremacy at work. You know, because it's not important. If it's important, committee would have been set up. It's not considered important right now. That's all I can say. Thank you, Ms. Pat and Ms. Ferreira. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Owen. Well, I like Rihanna's suggestion that we ask the town manager to come to the last half hour in a good meeting. And I think the agenda should be exactly what Deborah just described. And I think we should let him know ahead of time. We want him to have read our proposal carefully and come to us with any concerns or anything he wants to talk about changing or not, uh, and to plan for proceeding. He should know that before he comes. Uh, and perhaps the same with the resident oversight board, but starting with the successor group. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Owen. Yeah, and I, I, Mr. Vernon Jones, I'm in agreement. And I just want to emphasize that Mr. Bockelman was the one that recommended that we create a successor group to continue our work. And that's why we shouldn't be worried about ending in November 1. And I think it's important that we point that out. And that was something that we all depended on and sort of comforted, not comforted us, but made it somewhat okay that we were ending on such short notice and weren't able to cover the things that we wanted to cover. Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Ms. Pat? I was going to add... Uh, that it would be very, very nice if that successor group is appointed prior to November 1st to have CSWG and the successors group at least meet once. Wouldn't that be great, to, you know, to have that before we depart? So 
I don't, I don't see how that's going to happen before the end of October. It, because we're not meeting until in two weeks, right? And so that's when we hope to hear from the town manager. And then I don't know how long it takes him to put committee together. I know there are so many open openings in so many committees in our town. So I don't know how, whether or not people will jump into this committee, given the way the town council and the town manager has treated us sometimes um, disrespectfully. So we'll, we'll see if people will actually you know, apply. But we're encouraging the community to please apply. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Moyston. Um, so I'm just wondering if Mr. Balkman decides to move forward with the successor committee or gives feedback to Brianna and Alicia on whatever edits or revisions that he would like, it would be okay to move it forward faster, correct? With and he could still attend the 23rd, just take that piece off of it. And then for some reason, I was under the impression that the implementation team, although the members from CSWG might change with the members of the successor group, would be implementing the remaining of the recommendations that have to do, you know, there was the youth empowerment and the, um, the multicultural BIPOC center and a few other ones that I think that could be kind of handled at the same time, but I was under the impression that the implementation team or maybe there would be revisions on who was on there would be doing that as well. Or at least I at least advocated for that, like so that we can get everything done. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One that I am in agreement with Brianna's suggestion still that uh, Mr. Balkelman attend the last 30 minutes of our meeting if possible, and I think it would be important for us to be able to talk out some of the details and hopes that we have, um, especially in regards to being able to have the successor group set up before we're disbanded and the possibility of being able to meet with them or to even be a part of the process um, of figuring out the membership of that group. Um, I also just wanted to say, while I think that's a good idea, Ms. Moisten, I'm not sure that I was under that same impression. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I don't, I, I wasn't under that impression either because I think the successor, successor group is a group that's going to really make sure that all of the recommendations from part A and part B you know, get accomplished, they get accomplished in a timely basis, they get accomplished with the the kind of the essence and the root of what it was that CSWG had recommended them with, right? In terms of making sure that the focus is on BIPOC community and helping out those that are marginalized. And so the successor group is gonna really be the pivotal, pivotal kind of pressure point for the implementation group and everyone else to kind of do what they need to do, you know? I, and I think if we don't have that successor group, a lot of these things are going to fall through the cracks. That, that's what I think, you know? And that's why we wanted, right? That's why we had talked to Mr. Bachman to extend us because we wanted to be that group to kind of make sure that the recommendations were, were put in place. But, you know, that what that, you know, you didn't want that to happen um, because, in, you know, and I'll say it because I'll say it publicly because we were going to be very strong and we're yeah. going to push it. <laughs> we're yeah. going to push it to make sure it would happen. And now this successor group is going to happen and we don't know who, what, where, when, and that's why we need him and we need to have that conversation. I just wanted to make it clear that the implement, that it would just be like a new implementation group because the town managers most like, so it would be the members from, I, I would just assume that it would have worked similar to the way the implementation team works now so that you would have members from the successor group and town staff working together to, to implement the things that need to be moved forward. They can still be that fire underneath it, I, but there has to be some type of town staff involvement when it comes to making those things happen. That's all I was saying. I just wanna be clear because sometimes um, what I'm saying gets misunderstood, so. Yeah, so you're saying two different groups, right? The implementation, yeah, yeah. No, we're saying the same thing, we're on the same page. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. 
Um, so if it is all right with the group, Brianna and I, uh, prior to this meeting, had the intention of reaching out to Mr. Bockelman again to see if it would be possible to meet with him next week, because although we did meet with him on Friday, um, a lot of that discussion needs follow up. Um, and there weren't any uh, real conclusions or answers that came out of that meeting. And so if it's possible, and if he is available for a meeting next week, we can still pursue that um, so that we can give him the idea of what we're looking for at the meeting that he'll be present at the following week so that we can uh, suggest that he, well, I honestly hope that he has read the document before we're able to meet with him next week and that he may be able to provide suggestions at that point. But in case that is not the case that we can suggest that he go over the document before um, the meeting that he attends. Um, I'm not sure if you all would like us to follow through in that way. Uh, Ms. Ferrer and then Ms. Moyston. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's why I was suggesting that because you all are working overtime. You know, you all are doing so much. You know what I'm saying? My thing would be just, you can email him and say, hey, this is boom, 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 boom. This is what we need you to, to you know, talk to us about. This is what we want to discuss on, on the meeting, you know, the last half hour. Beforehand, though, if you want to, you know, redline, tell us already your vision for the succession group, blah, 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 please feel free, you know? I mean, I, I don't think you all need to go take up your time again. And that's why I was suggesting you come to a meeting because then as a group, we could be like, okay, you know, you were sent this email, you had this information. Now what's your plan? What's your vision? Give it to us, you know, as opposed to you all taking your time, but you know, it's up to you if you wanted to do that extra step. I wouldn't recommend it. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, did you also have a hand up? Um, no, okay, I apologize. Um, I, I think it's up to the two co-chairs. I'm comfortable with it, whatever you decide with regard to this. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pat? So I just want to make a comment and um, I just, that's my personal opinion. I hear what uh, Ms. Ms. Moisten stated about, you know, for, uh, for people to also consider natural leaders in our community to apply for town government jobs. Strong BIPOC women have applied and they got rejected. But if you're weak, you get hired. I don't know how blunt I could say it. That's what is happening in our town government right now. I don't know how else. So I don't know how responder jobs will, you know, play out to be. Would will, will BIPOC folks actually be hired who are ready for reform in this town? I don't think so. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mr. Vernon Jones. I agree there's a big risk there, and I think we have to insist and figure out how to get involvement of some of us on the hiring committee so that the strongest possible BIPOC people are hired. Uh, I also want to say that, in my opinion, Jennifer Moyston is a strong BIPOC woman and did get hired in the town. And I don't want anything, as Pat just said, I don't, I don't it's, in it's, general disagree with Ms. Pat, but I don't want to that what it, I meant? it to be taken as a comment about Ms. Moyston. It, it's not what I meant, but seriously. Um, I didn't think you can't was. not be strong and be a BIPOC person and work for the town of Amherst. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, really. Seriously, can I, can I speak? There are different ways of being strong. If you're seen, if, you, if, you're, if you are spoken and you're seen as a threat, you don't get the job. You can still be outspoken, but present your message in a different way. You will be hired. It is happening as we speak right now. Oh. We will be losing highly qualified professionals to other towns that might grab them. Okay, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to say much. So let's not say what are the employees. There are employees. I can get people to apply for responders, but if this, those people are vocal and speaks you know, true to the power, Will the town management actually hire them? Is the question. 
Thank you, Miss Pat. Miss Ferreira. Yeah, and I, I mean, and I totally understood what Miss Pat was saying, just because you know, you know, even with Miss Moisten, who is a strong woman, there. I mean, you no. need more strong people of exactly. color, more women, uh, by yeah. women of color. You know, we always know that in 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 town jobs and in other jobs across you know, Amherst and everything, usually you have one and that's it. Yeah. And then they think, okay, that's enough. That's, that's you know, no, that's not enough. You need like, to, why can't we have a half? Why can't we have, you know, a majority of people be BIPOC in, in town management and, and things like that, you know? And that's the part. It's just like a lot of times when there are strong BIPOC people that apply, they don't get they it. Don't get they don't they get don't. hired. They don't. And then when I know so. Get, I have statistics. People talk in the community. I know what's going on in our town government. They're not getting hired. And stop I, people, you know, stop saying, where can we find BIPOC folks? We're in this town. And I'm not, I'm not looking for a job. I have my own business. But I know people who would like to stay and work here, but they're too radical to work for the town. I'm pissed. We That's need to be, it, it needs to be a reflection of the community. I think I've said that plenty of times, the staff here, and I think I'm, 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 we're, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated. I'm gonna, yeah. We have to be nice to white people to get our jobs here. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Bowman. Um, and one of the issues with when a BIPOC person gets hired in one of these town communities or town positions or whatever position they might be in is that they get um, overworked. They become the voice of every person of color. They become the voice of every black person. They become the voice of every whatever the situation may be. And they get overworked and then they get tapped out and then they're like, done. They want to be done. They don't want to deal with it anymore. Um, I know multiple people who worked for the school. It's not turned on. I worked for multiple people. For the, I know people who worked for the school who left because they were being dragged across, across the coals every single time something happened with a person of color. They were being pulled in and dragged through the trenches to like answer questions and help the situation and blah, 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 blah. So as a community of BIPOC people, that's the other piece of it. We have to be working together. We, we gotta be, we can't have one person of color applying for a job. We gotta have, you know, a multitude. We gotta have, we gotta figure out ways to be, you know, making sure that we're giving support to um, our community so they feel comfortable applying for jobs. Like I, I just thought about a job the other day and I was like, oh, I'm not applying for this job. I don't feel comfortable. But then it was like, I had a friend look at me and be like, you're overqualified for the job. Like you can do this job and it's not even an, like it wouldn't even be an issue. And, and anybody who knows you, who's seen you work, knows that this would not be an issue for you. And I still am second guessing myself. So this part of the problem is that in this community, I've noticed that whether or not you have the letters behind your name, this community has kind of like caused a situation where specifically BIPOC people don't have any confidence. And part of the reason why they don't have confidence is also because they know they're gonna walk into work every day and be the only. And that's hard, you know, that's really hard. Um, I've done it many, many times. Um, I'm part of the midwifery community and the doula community around here. And there's one or two or three work like, but only one that's like recognized in like the Boston area. And there's one, the first black midwife, home birth midwife in Connecticut. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's,
like when we see one of our own, and when I mean one of our own, I mean any BIPOC community, community person going out for a job or they mention that we need to throw like a lot of support behind them and we need to help um, we need to help, you know, we need to encourage our community to throw a lot of support behind them because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times we just feel alone. We just feel alone. And then we feel tapped out and it's, and it's hard. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I want to see my more diversity in, in the town government, but like, and I was like, really considering going for town council but like i'm from this group and from the the politics and stuff from this group i'm tapped out i'm totally tapped out and it's like that's what ends up happening that's exactly like i'm a prime example of what ends up happening because do i have the ideas do i have the like drive do i have the passion do i have the like voice absolutely but i'm tapped out and I'm not even like, I can't do it. And so we need to figure out a way to make it so that we're not causing our community and potential leaders in our community to be tapped out. Um, and I love you all, but I really gotta go. <laughs> Speaking of tapped out, I gotta eat some dinner. I gotta be to work at seven. I'm exhausted. You can see it in my face. Um, so I love you all. Um, and I'm crawling into bed to watch the old school Fantasy Island with Tatsumi, the plane, the plane. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? <laughs> it's on Tubi. Just, just in case y'all were wondering, it's on Tubi. It's for free. So I'm going to watch that. <laughs> I need to decompress. And that's how I'm going to decompress and eat my quesadilla. And so all the love to all of you, because I love you. All right. Good night. Thank you, Tashina. Thanks, Tashina. <laughs> Can I just? I love, I love this group. We have a lot of fun. Wait, we're know, going I'm... for margaritas on the what this is culture. that? What I like October... about this group. What I like about this group is we're not following the. I tell you. You heard margaritas. Wait, you're coming. I heard back. margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so our October twenty eighth at eight o'clock. We are going for margaritas. <laughs> Do not forget me. <laughs> All right, now I'm actually going. Bye. I'm sorry, Miss Pat. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Going to say one thing I like about CSWG: we are not traditional committee. We are not following the the stand, whatever the, whatever it is, but we're getting a lot of work done. And that's one of the things I'm going to miss with this group. I really miss you all because I like the way we conduct our business. Whether people like it or not, we are getting a lot done. Rather than being too serious in meetings and you can't speak your mind, you know, you're timed and everything, that doesn't work for me. I love this group. I think other committees should, you know, uh, take notice because we are diverse uh, people in this town and it's not only the way the white people run their meetings, we should not follow that. It doesn't apply to some of us when we run meetings. So this, this is really good. There's nothing wrong with that. The most important thing is that we're getting things accomplished. We're getting a lot of work done. We're being productive, right, people? Right. Okay. Are you done? Just joking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm delirious. I've been here too long, and it's hot in here, yeah. and I'm tired. Yeah. So right. I, I just wanted to make a few comments. One is, I think that, Pat, you raised good points, and I know it's been completely frustrating because I'm here with you, and I can see it in you guys all, and it, but you guys have definitely set a little bit of a new standard, right? Because what used to work for other committees, like for instance, when you guys went to went to present to the finance committee, that the way that that went is, is pretty typical of how it usually goes, but maybe that doesn't work anymore, right? So you guys definitely have changed and set the bars from some for some community 
or it's for some changes in local government again i'm starting to fade um <clears throat> but also you know you guys have definitely made more movement than any other committee that has been established in such a short time and even though i know that not everything has worked out the way that you've wanted it to that there's still been a lot of movement made and that you've opened the doors for a lot more um involvement from the bipoc community and for changes in local government and then on the employment side i don't you know maybe i just shouldn't even talk about it but i, I so what I will say is yes, we needed this to be a reflection of the community and it, and and that does need to happen. Um, we need true representation. What I will say is a lot harder, as Tashina said, to come in and stay. The microaggressions are, can be real at times and then the response to that can be real. And because they're microaggressions, people don't necessarily understand the reaction all the time. Um, so it, you know, it's, it is, you know, I don't even know how, I just don't want to, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm going to stop now is for what I'm going to say, but I've really enjoyed our work in our very long and late evenings and, and look forward to the 28th for margaritas and, you know, some just regular everyday talk. If I may very quickly, we talk about supporting BIPOC employees in our town. I think we shouldn't look any further than what we've done with Jennifer. I know at least I'm one of the people that pushed that Jennifer should be recognized and promoted in her job. I was very vocal about that. And CSWG, you know, agreed. That's how support looks like. And the town manager did a good job by considering and appointing her that, I think that's what we should be doing. If you have the platform, you don't even have to have the platform. Speak up. If you feel that BIPOC folks have no career path working in this town or something, you know, just organize a small group of people and said, you know, I think this person needs to move up. So we've set this standard. It can happen. We can do it. Thank you. And also, too, like there's, I know that we're trying very hard to change the inside culture here at Town Hall, because there's something about the fact that if you come to pay a bill or if you come and have an interaction with the town and it's not a positive interaction, there's not much encouragement for saying that I want to go work there, right? Like all of these things matter, right? From being out on the fields, the different fields that we have, the interactions with people over at Amherst Rec, with all of the families, all of that matters. And so it's really important that the inside of our in, our our internal from the buy-in from the top down is really enforcing that change so that we can open up the doors more and so that people feel more welcomed it's just you know it, it, we're in the middle of a change and i don't know we can i can feel it here right like there's a shift happening and so you know we're gonna power through it one last thought, and I promise his last thought is, I went to do a, a transaction at our town hall, and to my greatest surprise, I saw an African-American male greet me by my name. And I've lived in this town for more than 35 years. It's never happened. I had this visceral reaction of, at last, I actually walked into town hall and somebody actually greeted me on walking in. But it shouldn't end there. I would like this young man at some point to move up the career too, not just, I'm not saying being receptionist is not a good job, but you know, if there are opportunities for him, also I think, you know, it should be considered. But just to walk in to have the face of a, a, a young black man meant a lot to me. I've never seen that since mm -hmm. living in this town. And, and I, I, ju I just felt welcome. Let's put it that, that way. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that HR in general, I think is and not even just HR. It's one of the things that when my position changed that I and we have the director steps in that I want to work on a little bit more is how we support 
the staff. I mean, if you haven't noticed, we've had a high retention lately, right? And so something's going on. So we need to support staff and we need to support the incoming BIPOC staff and incoming staff in general so that they want to stay, right? Like that's, that's what, you know, government jobs used to be those jobs that, you know, people come in and, and like high school and work their way all the way up and stay for 30, 40 years, right? Kind of need to get back to that. I also think it would be nice, you know, with the housing, it's hard to go out and recruit people from other areas. So for instance, like the town clerk, you're looking for someone who already has that background and you just, you know, if there's one, it's hard to get someone to come to come stay here when the rents are so high sometimes and the the housing, you know, the property taxes are so high and the housing market is so high. So there's, a, I mean, I'm not making excuses for anything by far. I'm just saying that these are some of the barriers and the challenges that, that we face. And so I don't believe that that will stop us from making this an equitable and inclusive town, but you know, it is, it, it's hard. It's not, just not it, always as easy. Not always. Sometimes it, it is that easy. We can't hear you, Alicia, but I'm really hoping you're saying that we're going to like. Sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to take a minute. I said thank you, Ms. Moisten, also. Sorry. Um, so I wanted to take a minute before ending the meeting tonight also just to express my appreciation for you all for your hard work, your perseverance, and your bravery. Um, I want to take a minute to acknowledge the harm that has been done um, and to acknowledge your resilience. And I think that it, you all are amazing. And I feel very privileged to be able to have been working with you all. Um, and so I want to remind you all to practice self-care, um, whatever that looks like for you. If it's like Tashina watching movies and eating quesadillas, I encourage you all to end your night that way. Um, and to continue to take care of yourself while we finish out this very important but challenging work. Deep breath time. Let's let it go. Yeah, right. I am a product of my environment, right? Like that's what it is. Take a deep breath, everyone. should be doing some yoga. <laughs> All right, are we gonna hear those famous words? So, we, we we got anything that has not been adjudicated within 24 <laughs> hours of the meeting, I would call this meeting adjourned. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Yay. Thank you everyone in the audience for sticking around. Thank you. Thank you all.